applause. Great job. Thank you all. Thank you for, for that, Parker. God bless you. Um, just making sure we got through everything. All right. Well, uh, for just the next few minutes, we're going to be talking and continuing on the line of where I've been uh, covering uh, this topic of understanding or under, who, uh, under whose authority do we stand. For those of you that haven't been here, we've spent some time over the last couple of weeks talking about understanding biblical authority, not the kind of authority that I think a lot of times we think about just, you know, um, that connects to people, but understanding the power of this authority that God brought into the world. In a nutshell, we've talked about the importance of understanding the principle of biblical authority. We covered the two highest levels of authority in our kingdom social order. Number one is God, and that includes the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. The Creator God is the ultimate source of power and authority in the universe. He alone is omnipotent, all-powerful, almighty Lord of Lord, King of Kings. The second in order of that is the Word of God. Now, this is interesting because in today's world, in our world, and a lot, even amongst the Christian community, people do not believe that the Word of God is authoritative and is actually the Word of God. The Bible. Why do I list it as number two? Because the Bible tells us that the second place of authority is God's Word. Because what the king says is what the kingdom does. The Bible says that it's because of God's word, it propels the universe. It holds all things together. The word of God in my world is second in authority. I trust God, but how do I know what God's will is and what his purpose is? Am I just guessing? No, he gave us his word so that we would know what His will is, and what, what our purpose is, and what His plan is. So the, the second in authority is God's Word. You need to trust and realize that the Word of God in your mouth, one guy said, and I mentioned that, Reinhard Bonnke, he was a, a, a German evangelist for many, many years, and he made a statement, and he said, the Word of God in your mouth is as just as powerful as the Word of God in His mouth if you will believe it. So the Word of God has authority. Then we establish the fact that all other positions of authority are delegated. They're delegated from God. Why? Why are they delegated? Because if you recall at the beginning of creation, God created humanity and placed them on the earth to have dominion and rule over creation under his authority and as a result of the decision that he made to release authority and rule and dominion to mankind which we see that in the bible in the story of adam and eve when when god told them to have dominion over the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and every living thing that, that walks on the face of the earth god released his authority and because he did that he gave legitimate, rightful authority and power to humanity. And he laid that down, and because he laid that down and released that to them, he can't take that back. And mankind became the decision makers. Mankind became the representatives of God on the earth. And that was how God would get through the earth, is that he would work with man. And I wrote in your handout there the one of the concepts and ideas that we have to embrace and understand is that God works through, man, hu, works through humanity, not apart from humanity. He works His plan through us, not for us. So many people want to blame God for everything that goes bad in the world. Well, you know, if God really loved us, there wouldn't be so many starving people over in this part of the world or in that part of the world, guess what? It's not God's fault. That's, he gave humanity 
authority over the earth. If you destroy the earth, that's your business. God's going to go, hey, it's yours. I gave it to you. The principle of authority is so important for us to understand and for us to get a hold of. Why? Because if you ever really want to see consistent victory in the world, if you want to see positive results in the world, or even in your own life, you have to get a hold of this principle of authority. And it's probably not just the way we see authority, it's understanding the spirit of authority, this principle of authority. St. Augustine, one of the early church fathers and respected theologians, believed this principle so much, he put his thought into this known phrase, and I shared it with you before, and it says this, it says, without God, we cannot. Without us, God will not. See, Martin Luther the really considered to be the father of the Reformation, he made a statement, and this was his statement. He said, I pray as if everything is up to God, but I work as if everything is up to me. He understood this partnership. He understood that it is God working through us, not God doing it outside of us. Jesus himself, when he taught his disciples to pray in what has been called the Lord's Prayer, when he said he taught them to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your what? Your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he's telling them that through their prayers... And their connection with God, the will of God, is going to enter into the world. What if I told you today that the way the will of God and the plan of God and the kingdom of God comes in this world is only through you and through me, and there's no other way that it's getting into this world. God's will gets into this world through you, and that's it. There's nobody else. You're it. Jesus is telling them, your participation with God is what changes this world. He was letting them know how the kingdom works. And the reason that I keep driving this point hard is because you can't have dominion until you understand where dominion comes from. Dominion comes from position. Dominion is authority, and authority is a product of placement or position. So, God puts you in a position or people get placed in a position. Some people here today hold different positions of authority at a job or whether you're law enforcement or whatever you are. You have a position of authority. What you do with that position is up to you. God places us in that position. God placed Adam and Eve in a position of authority. And what they did with that position was their decision. How many of you would agree with me today that it wasn't a good decision that they made? Right? But God released the decision to them. He did not interfere with their will. And God still doesn't today. He allows you to make decisions. Dominion is authority. The weight of authority you carry depends upon how you are positioned with the one who who has authorized you. Which we will talk more about that later on um, in the coming weeks. Once I laid down that principle of how authority works and where it comes from, we turned our attention to the three most important characters in this human story, and that is Jesus, humanity, and the devil. Jesus, humanity, and the devil. We talked about Jesus and understanding the importance of who Jesus was. Before he came to the earth and who Jesus is now, he is not only the Son of God, but he was also the Son of Man. Jesus appeared on earth to redo what Adam undid. I know that's not proper English, but it works. Jesus came to undo or redo what Adam undid. 
The first Adam lost the God-given dominion, but the last Adam, the Apostle Paul called him, Jesus the last Adam, Jesus Christ restored what was lost. Let me add one more thought, and then I'm going to move on, but I want to make sure we understand how important this is. We have to understand what happened in the garden because that is where the order of God was put into motion. Everything began there because that is where God started everything moving. That is where spiritual authority was put in motion. That's where spiritual authority was lost. The rule was broken. That's where everything began to go south. And that's where, if we don't understand what happened in Eden, we're not going to understand what happened at the cross. If, if it wasn't for Eden, there would be no need for Calvary. If we don't understand the first Adam, you're not going to understand the last Adam. If you don't understand Genesis, you're not going to understand Jesus. We need to understand the beginning or you're never going to figure out the end. God has a plan. The interesting thing about it is people today, there's a big battle of whether big things out there on the, you can go on, you know, on YouTube and Instagram. And are we living in the last days? Are we living in the last days? Well, this is what I'll tell you. When you look at history and the timeline of history, one of the biggest plans that God has was for Jesus to come, for the Messiah to come, and for a new creation to be birthed into this world. That happened 2,000 years ago. So I can tell you this. I don't know if it's 1,000 years. I don't know if it's 500 years. It's probably not tomorrow or the next day after that. You kids that are here, you'll be able to live your life and do all that you're going to do. But all we know is one thing we do know is that we are closer to the culmination of all things than we ever have been in human history. The Old Testament, think about that. The couple thousand years that all of that information gathered together for Jesus to come into the world and it's been 2,000 years since Jesus. Can you imagine that? 2,000 years and we're still celebrating one event. Isn't that incredible? 2,000 years later. So are we closer to the end than we are to the beginning? Yes. Because Peter said it. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, he said in the last days. He said that began the last days. Remember I talked to you about the now and the not yet? We're in the middle. We're in this two circles coming, the old and the new. And we're in the now and the not yet. The old, we're, the new is here. We may not see it all happening right now, but we are moving in the positive light of the new. I don't know how it all ends. That's the big battle today. And that's why I told all of you to go out and read and study all the eschatological views that are out there because not one person is totally right. You get to studying all of that, and once you go through all of that, you'll find out you know less about the end than when you started. But you go read it. All I know is, is that we have to get on track. Look at your neighbor and say, if it is to be, it's up to me. See, we always want somebody else to take responsibility for it. Let somebody else do it. I don't want to mess with that. And let somebody else do that. Yeah, it, it, you don't ever want to mess with it until it's in your front, in your living room. And then when it's sitting in your living room, all of a sudden it matters to you now. Well, God is saying, wake up. Look at your neighbor and say, wake up. Seriously, wake up. You that are sleeping, wake up. No. <clears throat> I left you with a question last week, and this next part we're going to roll through, because I'm just gonna, literally going to roll it out and give you the information, and you do your own homework. Here was some questions I left. I said, at what point in Jesus' human life 
Did he receive his authority over all things? Because I laid out all these scriptures to you, and I showed you that Jesus said, the, you know, God gave me this authority, I have authority over this, I have authority over that. Well, if we believe that Jesus did all that he did on this earth as a human being, under the delegated authority of God, released to him, when did he receive that, and why does it matter? So here's the answer, in my view. This is when Jesus got his authority released to him to be able to do everything he did. The day the Holy Spirit fell on him. When he was baptized, he came up out of the water. The Bible tells us the Holy Spirit fell on him. And what did he immediately do? He went into the wilderness, and face the temptation. Isn't it interesting that he had the same challenge with the devil that Adam and Eve did? He faced the devil's temptation. Come and follow me. Hey, I can, I, he said, the devil says, look, I, I have all of this. Bow down and worship me, and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. He faced the same temptation that Adam did. Isn't that interesting? The last Adam had to go through what the first Adam did, but he was successful. He didn't bow the knee. He did not sell out. <clears throat> so we know that all the miracles of Jesus started after he came out of the wilderness. There's nothing recorded in the Bible prior to the day the Holy Spirit fell on him. There's some people make up stuff. There are historical references to Jesus doing this when he was 10 or whatever, but we don't have any biblical, nothing in the Bible, <clears throat> excuse me, about that, but all of his miracles, power, everything came to him. So what, why is that important to us? Let me tell you why. Because if Jesus did it as a man, and he did it under the power of the Holy Spirit, and you are human beings, what can happen to you if you learn to follow the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit? In your life. Guess what? <clears throat> when we see the book of Acts, <clears throat> they did. They believed it. The Holy Spirit fell on them, and they went out, and they turned the world upside down. They changed it. They changed the world. Look at this right here. Psalm 115, 15 through 17 says, The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth He has given to the children of man. So that tells us right there that God gave the earth to us. We, we, have the, we have the authority. We have the position. We have the decision. The only place that you can discover who you were and who you are now is not in a science book, not in a classroom, not in a college or a university. The only place that you're going to find yourself is in the Bible. You want to find out who you are, who you were then, and who you are now. Look to the Word of God. And some of you, that you go, what? You, you've been searching for yourself your whole life. You know, I've heard that statement. Where, you know, I traveled the world. What were you hunting for? I was trying to find myself. Well, I could have saved you a trip. <laughs> You're standing right here. But people do, right? Oh, I got to go find myself. Stop. Right here. Look to the Word of God, and God will show you who you are and who He wants you to be. If you're not happy right now, stop. Look to the Word of God. Cut everything else out of your life and start focusing in on the Word of God, making your connection with Jesus, and I'm telling you, you're going to find purpose. That's where you're going to find it. You're not going to find it on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or this tube and that tube, whatever. All, I can't keep up with all of them out there today. You're not going to find them there. Stop. Shut off everything. Open the Bible and look. God gave you the owner's manual right in front of you. Stop, pick it up, see who you are. It has always been God's plan for the kids to rule the planet. I know that's a funny statement. 
but it always has been. God's the Father, we're the kids. He wanted us to rule. That's what he did. Dominion is my birthright. Say to your neighbor, dominion is my birthright. Authority belongs to the family. If you're in the family, it belongs to you. He gave it to you. Why do you think the world continues to say that human beings are no different than the animals? Oh, we're just mammals. We're all mammals. Well, if you want to be a mammal, you go right ahead. I'm a human being created in the image of God. Mammals, these other creatures that are four-footed, they're not created in the image of God. I am. I am created in the image of God. I have a spirit. I have an eternal spirit. Animals, no, nowhere in the Bible does it say animals have an eternal spirit. We do. We were created in the image of God. God gave us authority and dominion over the animals. I wish my dogs would listen to me. <laughs> they haven't quite figured that out. I tell them all the time, I have authority over you. Don't make that spot in the living room. Outside. No, I'm going to make him use the toilet. One or the other. I'm going to. But God gave you rule, okay? God created us to rule, not to be ruled. God created us to rule, not to be ruled. Why do you think you hate it when somebody tells you what to do? No one in here likes it when somebody tells them what to do. It, it always goes against our nature, doesn't it? Right? How many of you wake up every day and just go, oh, I love it. Well, I'm going to go out and look for somebody to tell me what to do. No, we don't like it. Why? Because in our makeup, in our design, God put us in charge and he created us to rule, not to be ruled. That's why. But he wants you to know how to rule. Jesus came and showed us through a ser being a servant. We're supposed to serve our world and love our world. Here's the long and the short of the truth of the Bible about humanity. Here it is. God created us to rule and have dominion on earth, not in heaven. Whether you do it or not, that's your decision. Whether we take responsibility for it or not, that's our decision. But this is the facts. Okay, this is the facts. God created us to rule and have dominion on the earth. Man lost the authority. He lost his dominion. He lost his relationship with God when he listened to the devil. When he listened to the serpent, he deceived them. They disobeyed God's clear instructions. Don't eat from that. Whatever that is. They did, and it killed them. Killed them. Now, who's the devil? That's, go, I, I did a whole series on that at times past. You can go online or talk to Ryan, and he can point you into the series that's online there about the devil, angels, and demons, where they all came from. But, a brief, but briefly, who is the devil? He was a, he's a created being. He was an archangel. He was created to be one of the highest angels in, the, in all of creation, some say that the devil was the highest angel in all of creation, only under God. He was the worship leader of heaven. From what history or what the Bible tells us, the prophet Ezekiel described him as the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He was the anointed cherub who covers. He was an amazing created being. And then it tells us that he was in that position until sin was found in him. He wanted to be, the Bible says, like the Most High. He said, I'm going to raise myself up to be God. I'm going, to, I'm going to rule over everything. And God says, no, you're not. Bad idea. Jesus said, um, Jesus called him Satan. And he said that he saw him fall like lightning from heaven. What that was, but all I know is Jesus said, I was there. I saw him fall. I saw him get booted. From that point on, he became evil, a liar, a deceiver, a destroyer. The Bible says that he is the prince in the power of the air. 
Some say that he became the enemy of God. Well, guess what? Guess what? He is not the enemy of God. God has no enemies. God is up here. Angels are here. They are created beings. Not, God is not created. There is no equal. God has no enemies. You know what God does to enemies? Goodbye. Toast. It, it, God can wipe out any enemy at any time in any place. He is all-powerful. He has no enemies. So here's a revelation. And the sooner you get this, the better. Satan is not at war with God. He is at war with you. Satan is not at war with God. He is at war with you. Why? Because now, when Jesus came, he lost his authority. Jesus got it back, and he released it, and we're going to talk about it. He released the authority to you and I. So why is Satan at war with us? Because you've got more authority now than he does. But he wants you to not know it. As long as he can keep you ignorant of who you are and what authority you have over him, he will let it fly. But he, he is not at war with God. He is at war with you. And you're at war with him. We're in a war. Look at your neighbor and say, wake up. How many of you can see it going on right now in the world? We are in a spiritual war. I don't like it. But we got to do it. We got to do it. The Apostle Paul says, "We got to. We got to put on the armor of God." That's where we're at. Put it on. If it's going to happen, it's up to you. When Adam and Eve listened to the devil instead of God, they died spiritually, and then sooner or later, that spiritual death, which is called sin, eventually caused physical death. The story of that is in Romans chapter uh, five, twelve through. 17, but you can also read Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. The Apostle Paul does a good job of lining out the whole thing of Adam, what came into the world, what Jesus did, what power we have, and how we're able to walk now in a different way if we just listen to the Word of God. Now here's the best news. Here's the best news of all. Jesus became us so that we could become Him. Jesus became us so that we could become Him. It was always God's goal that you be transformed into the image of Christ. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said. And we're coming to the end here, so, so focus in. He said this, For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. Well, what's His purpose? See, many times we take verse 28 and we stop. Well, look what 29 says. What's His purpose? He said, For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. So what does that mean? Why? Why did God want us to become into the image of His Son? Why was this God's plan to form us into the image of, of His Son? Why? Because Jesus is the prototype of all born-again people. He's the first in a new generation. The Bible says we're a new people. We are a chosen race. Okay, if your physical race is more important to you today than the Jesus race, you got it all backwards. You got it all backwards. Because now, the Bible says, there is now no more Jew or Gentile, slave or free, this race, that race. We are all one in Christ. Whether I'm white and you're black or you're brown, tan, green, if you're the Incredible Hulk, doesn't matter. We're all in Christ. Because that's all that matters. Amen? Being in Christ is what sealed your fate not being whoever you are in the natural world. Jesus is the prototype. What does prototype mean? It means an original model on which something is patterned, an archetype, the first of many. So Jesus is the firstborn of a new creation, physically. 
Yes, the Son of God always has been, but the Son of God took on a physical form. He, we talked about that. He is permanently and, and forever changed, but He now stands at the right hand of God. Okay, look at Jesus didn't come to do this world to this world to be celebrated. He came to be duplicated. If he came to be celebrated, he would have had a parade and a bunch of pomp when he showed up and was born. But how was he born? He wasn't born in the same way kings are born. He's born in a cave somewhere in the middle of the night with a bunch of sheep. So what does that tell you? He doesn't want to be celebrated. He wants to be duplicated. He did it for you and me. Colossians tells us the Apostle Paul said that it's a mystery. This is an amazing mystery. But what is the mystery? Christ in you. The hope of glory. He wants Christ to be in you. Paul said that the mystery of all mysteries was not just how God was going to become a man in the person of Christ, but rather how God was going to get Christ in you. See, here, here's the deal. We celebrate Jesus. We should. But you know what Jesus does? He celebrates you. Because of what He did, He now changed you and He changed me. That is the amazing eternal truth of all time. We're different. Look at your neighbor and say, you are different. Here's a simple way to look at this process of restoration, transformation. I'm going to leave you with this. Right here, a couple things. Look at this. Jesus Christ with us. This is what He did. He came with us. He came as us, the Bible says. He came for us. He came to live in us. He came to work through us so that we could be in Him. That's it. There is the story of Jesus in a nutshell. He came to this world. What is, what is the, we look at the promise of Christmas. Emmanuel means God what? With us. So he came with us. He came as us, as a man, human being. He did it on the cross and the whole life, what? For us. And then when you get born again, he comes in you, in us, and now the Apostle Paul said that he lives through us so that we could be in him. That's the mystery of all of eternity. See, Jesus didn't just come to change your spiritual condition. He came to change your spiritual position as well. Some of you have your spiritual condition changed, but now you need to change your spiritual position right here who you are. The the major work was done. Now God is saying, take up your mantle. Be who you're supposed to be. See, true salvation for humanity isn't complete until both spiritual condition and position is restored. Spiritual condition has been fixed. God is waiting, and so is all of creation for us as the children of God to take our position and be who we were called to be. Our salvation isn't just spiritual. Salvation in the Bible is multifaceted. Look up the word. I'm going to give you the word. Here's the Greek word for salvation. S-O-Z-O. That's the word. Look up what it means. Look up. S-O-Z-O. Sozo. Look it up. You see what it means. It doesn't just mean eternal. It doesn't just mean spiritual. It is an entire thing that God wants you delivered from. God made a way for you to be who you're supposed to be. I have a statement on my desk, and this is it, honestly. So let's stand together. That'll prove it. Right here. Here it is. I have a statement on my desk, and this is something we should all realize. This is where we are. I'm not what I ought to be, but I'm not what I used to be. And by, the God, by God's grace, I'm not what I'm going to be. Look at your neighbor and say, that's me. See, I'm not right now 
what I ought to be, but I'm not what I used to be, and by, and by God's grace, I'm not what I'm going to be. Tomorrow's new. God has something else. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 Tell your neighbor, that's good stuff. All right. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, Father, we thank you for the promises that you have made to us, that you have shown us in your word the future, the destiny, the plan that you have for us. Help us to get a revelation of it so that we can take our position the way you eternally planned. And so, Father, we thank you today for the love you have for us, the patience that you have for us as we walk in this new place in your plan. And we ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.